Last year, journalists Laura Ling and Yuna Lee were working on a documentary along the border between China and North Korea when they were taken prisoner by North Korean soldiers. Laura faced a 12-year prison sentence and brutal treatment from her captors. But here in the United States, her sister Lisa was frantically working to get her out, which meant learning the art of diplomacy with one of the world's most isolated countries. The sisters have released a new book called Somewhere Inside, one sister's captivity in North Korea and the other sister's fight to bring her home. Laura Ling joins me now from Los Angeles. Laura, thanks for being here. Um, I thought we'd Hi, just Jan. start. It's really great to have you. I thought if we could, I'd love for you to just to take us back to that day. It was March 17th, I think, 2009. You were filming a documentary about, I think, North Korean defectors. What happened when the North Korean soldiers came upon you? That's right. Well, we were at the Tumen River that borders China and North Korea, and we were there. There was never any plan or intention to cross the river. Uh, we were there to film this thoroughfare where North Koreans are using to escape the very brutal conditions in their homeland. We were with a local guide, a fixer, and foreign journalists often hire guides who have worked with media in the past to help them. And our guide was on the frozen river, and he continued to walk closer and closer to the other side, the North Korean side. He motioned for us to follow him, and we did. We ended up on the North Korean soil, and he pointed out a village off in the distance where he said there were some safe houses. Well, Jan, we knew that we needed to leave. This was not a place where we should be. We headed back across the frozen river to China, and that's when two North Korean soldiers started yelling with their rifles raised, chased us back onto Chinese soil, surrounded Yuna Lee and me, and then were intent on taking us back to North Korea. They dragged us um, quite violently across to the other side. And when I, I was struck by the butt of uh, the soldier's rifle and I blacked out as he was dragging me. Well, when I came to, I was in North Korea and I, I felt like I was in, I had just entered an alien planet. And, and I mean, was this all just very surreal? I, did you have a complete terror or did it all seem like this cannot be happening to me? I mean, here I was in the most isolated country in the world, one that regards the United States as its arch enemy, could not speak the language, did not know if I would ever see my family again, didn't know if I would live to see the next day. So that hit you all at once because you were immediately, I guess, we've taken to prison, uh, subjected to interrogations. What was your confinement like there in North Korea? And remember, as you said, I, this is one of the most isolated countries in the world. I think uh, most of us can't even picture what a prison would be like in North Korea. Was it uh, the conditions really severe? What did you experience? Well, I wasn't, thankfully, I was never sent to one of the notorious labor camps. In the first few days of our captivity, we were kept in a jail. Um, it was very dismal, a five by six foot cell, um, complete darkness when they closed a couple of slats on the doors. We could hear um, other North Korean prisoners in the cells next to, next to me. Eventually, we were moved to the capital city of Pyongyang, and our conditions improved. I was placed in a compound separated from Yuna Lee and never saw her again throughout my captivity. Um, I was in a room that had a bed, a bathroom, and a, a, an adjoining room where there were always two fem female guards that watched over me at all times. And you wrote that you bonded with them. I mean, were you able to communicate with them and, and uh, kind of did that help pass the time? It did. At first, they were very cold, very strict. I mean, these were people tasked to keep me captive. But I was all alone, and I craved some sort of human interaction. And there were real glimmers of humanity that, we, that I experienced from them. Um, I taught them some yoga poses. They asked me about dating in the United States. Now, their passion and their nationalism was very strong. I mean, they revere their leader, Kim Jong-il, and they are extremely patriotic, but they were curious about my life in the United States. So what was the most terrifying moment? Um, was it the capture? Was it when you heard 12 years for your prison sentence? When did it uh, really hit you as this was absolutely the most terrifying moment? Well, the capture, the violence on the river, uh, definitely, like, I 
what stayed in my head was that anything could happen. When I heard the words 12 years of hard labor with no forgiveness and no appeal, and that's when I really started to spiral into a depression. I started refusing meals. Um, but I did, try, and, and just thinking that I might never get to see my family or start a family, um, I actually tried to think of suitable women that I would want my husband to, you know, a suitable person for him to be with to take care of him. And that was so hard for me to do. But I, I just wanted him to be taken care of. And um, I did try to maintain hope as much as I could. Now, how old were you at that point? Uh, 33. So you were thinking, you know, this was going to be, you wouldn't be able to have children when you finally got out. He may have moved on. You're now right. pregnant, though, right? I I am. I am. Uh, we didn't waste any time, <laughs> but uh, I am pregnant. I'm, I'm due in a week and feel every day my husband and I consider a blessing. Well, for, congratulations on that. Um, I want to talk about your sister. I mean, obviously, family was really important. When you were in these um, kind of dire uh, conditions and you said you tried to keep hope alive and, and even when you heard the 12 year prison sentence, did you have a sense of what your sister was doing? How intensely she was working to get you released, the fact that she was even trying to get President Clinton involved, who obviously ultimately did. What did you know about what was happening back here in the United States? Well, Lisa and I are best friends. We've always been best friends. And I knew that she was working relentlessly and would never give up. Even though we were separated half a world away, I felt extremely connected to her. And I think that this book is also about that special bonds that sisters share and that bond that can get you through anything. Um, I was able to make four phone calls over the course of the nearly five months. Four? And phone only four phone calls? Only four. And phone calls from previous American detainees in North Korea had never been allowed. So these phone calls were unprecedented. Um, I had begged and begged my captors, please let me make a call. I'd like to call my sister. Perhaps she can try to move the needle because I know that she will do everything in her power. And, and, and it was fact, through these she, phone calls. Right. Well, in fact, she was able to to get uh, the former president involved. What did he say? I mean, you spoke with him. Uh, what did he say about his meetings uh, with Kim Jong-il? Well, President Clinton conveyed to me on the plane ride home, he said that Kim Jong-il told him, he said, you were the first person to call me when my father Kim Il-sung passed away, even before my own allies. That is something I've always remembered and respected, and I've always wanted to meet you. So do you think you would still be in that prison uh, were it not for President Clinton's involvement? How, how pivotal was that to your release? Um, it was conveyed to me that he was the best and last option for our release. And you know, my family and I refer to him as our rescuer in chief. We are so grateful because it was, it was an unpredictable mission into this very secretive society. Um, I don't know whether I would have been released or whether I would still be there today. Uh, all I know is that I'm grateful that so many people rallied behind us, and including Vice President Al Gore, who's the chairman of Current TV. And finally, I'm just a last question, um, and again, thanks for being with us. But as you know, some human rights groups were uh, kind of upset that they felt uh, some of their efforts, the safe houses you mentioned, had been exposed. Uh, do you have any remorse for that, or do you think that was something uh, that you may have put others in danger? Well, I mean, I have so much regret for my actions for actually following this guide in the first place. and. What I can say is that we tried everything in our power when we were documenting the story, filming people from below their faces or behind behind um, their heads so that they would not be, their identities would not be revealed, um, filming them away from where they lived, uh, destroying evidence in our possession while we were in North Korea, eating notes, and just trying to do everything in, in our power to try to safeguard these defectors. All right. All right. Well, Laura, again, thank you so much for being with us and talking about all this, and good luck next week. Thanks, Jen. <laughs>